Good afternoon. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Economic Club of Indiana. Thank you all for joining us today. This virtual event is the place to be challenged by prominent speakers and advance great ideas. Thanks for being part of it. My name is Kathy Langham and I am president and CEO of Langham Logistics. I'm also very honored to be president of the Economic Club of Indiana for the current season. Before introducing today's guest, I'd like to also take a moment to thank our outstanding group of platinum sponsors that were highlighted at the beginning of today's webinar, as well as on the virtual banner behind me. Thank you. Last season, many of our luncheons were the top trending events on Twitter. Let's keep it going by expanding today's conversation through social media. So if you haven't already, get out your phones now and post or tweet or like us so that all your friends will know that you are involved with the Economic Club of Indiana. The Economic Club Twitter handle is at Economic Club IN and we're also using the hashtag EconLunch. I am very pleased to introduce this month's speaker, the president and CEO of Freedom House, Michael Abramowitz. Freedom House is a nonpartisan voice dedicated to promoting democracy across the globe. Mike oversees a unique combination of analysis, advocacy, and direct support to frontline defenders of freedom around the world, especially those working in closed authoritarian societies. Formerly, he directed the US Holocaust Memorial Museum's Levine Institute, and he led the museum's genocide prevention efforts. Abramowitz spent the first 24 years of his career at the Washington Post, where he was national editor and then White House chief correspondent. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a for, former fellow at the German Marshall Fund and Hoover Institution. A graduate of Harvard, Michael is also a board member of the National Security Archive and a member of the Human Freedom Advisory Council for the George W. Bush Presidential Center. Audience, we would love for you to be part of the conversation. So as we listen to Mike's remarks over the next several minutes, we're gonna open our chat feature. So for any questions you have that could be directed uh, to Mike. Now I'm very pleased to present today's speaker, Michael Abramowitz. Thank you so much, Kathy, uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you for, to the Economic Club for having me here today. Uh, I'm truly sorry not to be there in person. Uh, I have a great many friends from Indiana, including Chuck Preston at the Lilly Endowment. The endowment is one of our longest standing supporters at Freedom House. And Chuck has always been a generous host to me during my trips to Indianapolis over the years. I look forward to my next trip in person. Uh, I, I'm, what I'm gonna do today is go over a few slides uh, you know, for maybe 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will have a conversation. I'm looking forward to that and your questions. And I'm sure as uh, that many of you might have last week's election on your mind, uh, and I do intend to get to that. So if we can just go up to the first slide, which is a slide with Eleanor Roosevelt and Wendell Wilkie. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, I have the great privilege of leading an organization with a proud history that has become increasingly relevant, sadly, in the world of 2020. We were established about 80 years ago to counter, believe it or not, the America First movement of that era. At that time, America was gripped by isolationism, even as the Nazis marched across Europe. And so a prominent group of individuals came together under the Freedom House banner to urge America to confront fascism. And they understood that American freedom, security and prosperity was dependent on the survival of democracy beyond our shores. Our founding patrons were pictured here, Eleanor Roosevelt and Wendell Wilkie, who was a Republican who had challenged FDR in the 1940 presidential election. With our country so divided right now, 
it may be hard to imagine how two political rivals could come together like this to advance the cause of freedom. But that tradition of shared values runs through the entire history of Freedom House, and we remain committed to it today. We are, as Kathy said, a nonpartisan organization that continues to enjoy bipartisan support. We're also a nonprofit organization supported by individuals, businesses, foundations, and governments. So I'm grateful to our donors who have tuned in today. And just like Roosevelt and Wilkie, we believe that the United States plays a unique role in the world as a champion and defender of democracy. Let's go to the next slide, please. As Kathy suggested, our mission of advancing human liberty rests on three core activities. We support frontline democracy and human rights activists all over the world. We provide, for instance, emergency assistance to vulnerable human rights activists and freedom defenders who get in trouble or those that may be pers persecuted for their religious beliefs. Second, we work with Congress and policymakers more broadly to advocate for measures that will strengthen democracy, both in the United States and beyond our borders. So just to give you one example, we partnered with Bill Browder, who you, you might know as the author of the Global Magnitsky Act, to get that act and Sergei Magnitsky, who died in a Russian jail after, after exposing corruption in that country. And this law is a game-changing law in the human rights arena allowing the United States to block visas and freeze assets for those individuals anywhere in the world who commit agree. Uh, this is a very important piece of legislation. I'm proud Freedom House has been involved in that. But we are perhaps best known for the final portion of our work, which is our research in documenting anti-democratic abuses rate countries on their performance and monitor emerging trends and threats to political rights and liberties. And the oldest and most comprehensive of our reports is called Freedom in the World. So let's please go to the next slide. This is our famous countries and territories around the world. We look at each country's performance on key indicators, such as whether they hold free and fair elections, whether they allow political participation, uphold the rule of law. We, we rate every country on a scale of zero to 100, where 100 is the most free and zero is the least free. And based on that, we assign a status of free, those are the green countries on this map, partly free, those are shown in yellow, and not free, shown in purple. So the Wall Street Journal calls us a democracy, and our work is cited by policymakers, the media, Companies and people like Condi Rice, Secretary of State, the new president elect Joe Biden, and comedian John Oliver have all used our work in, in, in their work. Well, let me just, well, while we're waiting to move, but let me just say that this report dates back to the early 1970s when democracy would, had really been knocked on its back heels. Communist regimes were in control over Eastern Europe and Eurasia, military dictatorships dominated Latin America. Even democracies like the United States and its partners in Western Europe were suffering a crisis in confidence. The purpose of freedom in the world was to raise the alarm uh, among policymakers about the threats facing democracy. And in many ways, it worked. A variety of local and global factors combined with strong US leadership soon contributed to a steady advance of democracy, the collapse of various dictatorships, and ultimately the implosion of the Soviet Union itself. This picture depicts the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it's quite incredible for those of us who remember that event to think about what has happened since then. Back then, many experts believed that democracy had won the day and that the major challenges to the democratic idea had been defeated and that it was just a matter of time before every country in the world enjoyed some kind of basic freedom. Stanford's Frank Fukuyama, one of Freedom House's current trustees, famously described that period as the end of history. But progress has sadly stalled. And even in our own country, the values of democracy, free and fair elections, freedom of speech, an independent judiciary, a free press, freedom from discrimination are being questioned by some. And we really believe that democracy is in retreat. This chart gives you an overview of what we call at Freedom House our democracy recession. Every year for the past 14 years, democracy has suffered a net decline around the globe, according to Freedom of the World. 
In other words, the countries that suffered a deterioration in political and civil liberties, so there were 64 of them last year, have consistently outnumbered those that registered improvements. Declines are taking place all over the world on every continent across the democratic spectrum. And today, it's fair to say that democracy is under a systematic assault. This is another way of looking at the data. What it shows is that only 44% of the countries of the world's countries are rated free, with the remainder rated either partly free or not free. And that picture looks even worse if you go to the share of the population rather than the number of countries. Just 39% of the world's peoples live in countries that we rate as free. And almost as many, 37%, live in authoritarian settings or failed states that we rate as not free. What's especially disturbing is that important and influential countries are backsliding in very serious ways. And that's what this chart shows. It focuses on two particular countries that are leading the authoritarian surge, Russia and China, both of which seem to be moving in a free direction a couple of decades ago, but that progress has been reversed. And since taking power in 1999, Vladimir Putin has led Russia in a decidedly authoritarian direction. The bigger authoritarian threat may, however, be coming from China, which has grown steadily less free over the past decade, despite starting from a very low base. We have another report called Freedom in the Net, which ranks China at the very bottom of a list of 65 countries uh, with respect to internet freedom. There's a so-called Great Firewall that blocks access to information for most of China's citizens. And the regime in Beijing has also interned over a million Uyghurs in concentration camps and has brazenly tried to justify this appalling repression of an ethnic and religious minority by claiming that the camps are job, training, job retraining centers. Rulers in other important countries are following suit using a very similar authoritarian playbook. They maintain the rituals of democracy, like elections, but this is all a charade. They put their political opponents in jail on trumped up charges. They fill their court systems with cronies to ratify their decisions. They smother civil society groups with regulations aimed at making it impossible for the organization to function. They have their allies buy up media outlets so the public hears only one voice. And in case that does not work, they drown out online criticism with armies of trolls and bots. And this chart shows some of the other countries you've been concerned about, Turkey, Poland, Hungary, Venezuela, right here in our own neighborhood, has descended from a functioning democracy to a really a criminal dictatorship in less than two decades with a huge economic collapse and a refugee crisis that rivals the one caused by Syria's civil war. One other trend which I'd like to talk about is the weakening of freedom in well-established democracies, including here in the United States. Here's an important statistic to think about. Of 41 countries that have enjoyed free status over the long term, 22 have experienced declines in the last five years, including France, Germany, Italy, the UK, and the US, which I'll talk about in a second. As if all this wasn't bad enough, let me introduce one other concern, the way that governments around the world have used a COVID-19 pandemic to curb civil liberties and human rights. And so this map really shows what we've known for quite some time, that COVID-19 is both a health and economic crisis, but it's also a crisis for democracy as well. And over the course of the last several months, we did a very serious in-depth study of the impact of the pandemic, including a survey of human rights activists and experts on the ground in many of these countries. And what we discovered is that the conditions of human rights and democracy has grown worse over the last six months in some 80 countries. And we're worried that this is gonna be a, you know, a long-term impact. This is happening in areas like uh, transparency and anti-corruption, free media, the holding of credible elections, the protection of marginalized groups. I'm a former journalist, uh, as Kathy said, and one point I will just highlight is that in 91 countries, that's almost half of the countries that we looked at, have experienced new or increased restrictions on the news media in response to the outbreak. So this is really a, a new and growing threat to freedom of expression and freedom of the press that we are quite concerned about. Let me strike one optimistic note, if I can. Not all is gloom and doom. And around the world, the unquenchable human desire for freedom has shown itself again and again through protest movements that began in 2019 and have continued in 2020, despite the pandemic lockdowns. 
This is a picture here of the protesters in Hong Kong, where millions marched the streets last summer to challenge the Chinese government's effort to roll back the limited democratic rights to which it had agreed in 1997, when British colonial rule in the territory came to an end. I had the privilege of standing with some of the protesters as they pressed the US Congress to pass legislation last year imposing sanctions on Chinese officials responsible for the egregious human rights violations in Hong Kong. The Chinese government pays attention to what we do at Freedom House. They imposed sanctions on me personally this past summer in retaliation for our out outspoken support of the protesters, along with sanctions they imposed on other members on members of Congress, as well as the leaders of other human rights groups. So China is not the only place where there are protests happening in Russia, Algeria, Lebanon, Thailand, even here, as you all know, in the United States. And I, her I fervently hope that these protests will eventually be seen as an inflection point, the moment when democracy's global fortunes began to be revived. And at the very least, they suggest to me that the demand for democracy is growing, even as it continues to be met by stubborn resistance by some leaders, or by many leaders, I should say. If I may just talk for a second about one country that is quite dear to my heart, which is uh, the country of Sudan. Freedom House recently honored two Sudanese groups that have driven the country's efforts to remove, recover from, a, from the legacy of their longtime dictator, Omar al-Bashir, who was overthrown last year under pressure from an incredibly brave protest movement. The movement's leaders formed a power sharing government with the military, and they hoped to transition to full civilian rule and democracy in the last few years. This is really an incredible story because really, Sudan really ranked very low in our freedom scores for many years. And it really shows that if, if democracy can come to Sudan, it can come anywhere. And working at Freedom House, I've had the privilege of getting to know a number of the people who have been working on the ground to, you know, to really help advance uh, democracy uh, in Sudan. And I want to just share one story that really speaks to me because it's about one of my Freedom House colleagues, Kaskandi Abdul Shafi. Kaskandi grew up in Darfur in Sudan, which as many of you might know, was a, was a site of a genocide about 10 years ago. Kaskandi and his family endured systematic violence at the hands of the Sudanese government. He witnessed a lot of conflict, unthinkable human atrocities, like the day that his village was attacked and 71 of his friends and relatives, including children and the elderly, were killed one morning. Kaskandi knew from a very young age that his own government was against him because of who he was, because of his ethnicity, and because of where he lived. And by the time he was a young man, he had become an advocate for freedom and for human rights. As a pro at a protest when he, was at a, when he was a university student, Kaskandi was arrested, then tortured, and almost killed. And he recovered in spite of that, uh, also, some of his other family members uh, had, uh, were arrested as well. Thankfully, Kaskandi was able to get out of Sudan, and today he works for Freedom House, helping the fighter, the freedom fighters, or the human rights activists of Sudan and other countries achieve something like he now enjoys here in the United States. His story is truly worthy of a separate speech, but for the purposes of today, let me just tell you this. Kaskandi has described to me of feeling that freedom is the ability to be himself, to choose what he wants to do and what to say, where he wants to live, who he wants to associate with. Freedom to him is the ability to answer honestly in a way that he uniquely wants to, the never ending stream of questions and choices that life throws, up, throws at you and that add up and make a person who they are. Think about that. Freedom is at its very heart, the ability to be me whatever me is. And I think that's a very good definition of freedom. Let me just conclude my talk before we go to questions with a quick look at the United States, uh, which has just obviously experienced a national election. And I'm sure we might want to discuss that. We're still sorting out the results there. But let me just sort of make a couple of points that I'd like to stress. One is that the United States has not been immune to some of the global trends that I've been describing, as this chart shows. The United States remains a free country. We have an intrepid and diverse media. We have a strong rule of law tradition. We have religious freedom, freedom of association, and a vibrant civil society that press our government for change and redress of wrong. 
we have a system really unlike any other in the world that has proved itself capable of self-correction. But as this chart shows, we've had some problems. And over the last 10 years, we have slipped in our democratic performance. I say this from a nonpartisan perspective. The decline has taken part, has taken place across both Democratic and Republican administrations. If I were to highlight a few areas of major concern going forward, it might be these, and there are three. Number one, the ongoing erosion and declining trust in institutions that are important for the health of democracy. Just to pick one that is dear to my heart as a former journalist, confidence in the news media is at a low point. And this is crucial as the press plays such a central role as a bulwark of accountability. And its job is made all the more hard by the flood of disinformation we see on social media. Number two, America's long-term struggle to deliver on its promises of equality and racial justice. When it comes to the essential matters of daily life, like getting a job, buying a home, finding a good neighborhood school for one's children, or simply walking the streets without fear of police profiling, Black Americans still often experience what amounts to second-class citizenship. We've made progress over the years, but, as a, but the pandemic has underscored in the most tragic ways we have a lot more work to do in this. And finally, if I could say the disproportionate influence of special interests and money in our political system. And this is not a new problem, but it's getting worse. If you look around the world, corruption is a growing problem for democracies and authoritarian countries alike. It tends to be an early warning indicator for much bigger problems, as in Russia, where the ability of oligarchs to tap public resources in the 1990s was a sign that the country's aspiring democracy was curdling into a kleptocracy. I fervently hope that once this election is settled, we can try to set aside our partisan passions and focus on the work of repairing our democracy. And this is important, not just for all of us, but for the, for the cause of global freedom. Now this may sound corny, but I really believe that we are an exceptional country with an indispensable role to play in the advance of human liberty. We need to approach this task with humility and a recognition that we have made mistakes, sometimes grievous ones. But given the strength and determination of democracy's adversaries, freedom and human rights will not advance without vigorous US leadership, which must include setting a positive democratic example at home. Believe me when I tell you that governments in other countries watch what we are doing very carefully. When we bash unfavorable reporting as fake news, they are emboldened to attack journalists. When our security forces target protesters, dictators feel entitled to do much worse. Ronald Reagan declared in his first inaugural address, as we renew ourselves here in our own land, we will be seen as having greater strength throughout the world. We will again be the exemplar of freedom and, and a beacon of hope for those who do not now have freedom. Nearly four decades later, nearly four decades later from President Reagan's inaugural, the idea that the United States is such an exemplar has been steadily battered and it's time to roll up our sleeves and get back to work on this issue. So I'm gonna pause right there, Kathy, and uh, look forward to having a conversation with you and with uh, the members of the, uh, 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 the, the club. Yes, th thank you. Really, really interesting remarks. And as you can imagine, um, the chat is filling up with lots of questions. So. Uh, thanks for that. It, it, so um, I'll start with a couple. How will, and, and based on the comments you just made, how will the outcome of the election affect the priorities of Freedom House? Well, I don't think it affects it too much. You know, we're pretty consistent, Kathy. We focus on big threats to freedom. You know, countries like Russia and China, uh, issues of uh, declining freedom on the internet. Uh, we try to support civil society groups and human rights defenders, as I was discussing. We want the United States to be a, an exemplar of strong democratic practice. It'll be interesting to see how the president-elect Biden focuses on these issues over the last four years. He spoke at a Freedom House event several years ago, and we also worked with him and the, his policy institute at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as the policy institute of former President George W. Bush, on a project in which we looked at the health of US democracy. So he definitely cares about these issues. 
And I think he and his advisors see the rise of authoritarianism as a big challenge going forward. So one project if I, that we're focused on is a report that we're working on with the McCain Institute, as well as the, uh, uh, the CSIS, which is a think tank in Washington, that's gonna make recommendations to the new administration on how to make democracy and human rights more of a centerpiece of, of US foreign policy, which we think is really important. So I think the priorities stay the same, but we might have some more, you know, different opportunities for the new administration. Great. A any insight for this group on those new recommendations? We're just honestly getting our, our head around it right now. Um, one of the issues that the vice president in a piece he wrote for foreign affairs last year, he called for a summit of the world's democracies in his first year in which he was going to uh, uh, bring together the world's democracies to, to talk about how they can work together to, uh, uh, to, to advance democracy and, and, and fight authoritarianism. So I think I would expect that report would hopefully have some concrete suggestions of how that uh, democracy summit might work. But they're already hard at work on that, I imagine. Yeah. In what way, I'm going to the chat here, in what way uh, have steps been taken by the US to combat the pandemic? It, it, so what steps were they that led you to list the US as one of the countries that has weakened democracy and its response to the pandemic? Well, first of all, let me just say a little bit more about the, uh, uh, the problem. I mean, the problems with the pandemic are, I would say, much worse you know, overseas in certain countries. So I mentioned the issue of uh, uh, cracking down on the press. We've had dozens of countries that have enacted, you know, new laws, essentially outlawing uh, uh, the journalists from reporting on certain things that might be uh, uh, critical of the, of the government response to the pandemic. We've even seen that, that that happened, for instance, in, in Egypt. And we've certainly seen uh, other countries, uh, for instance, Tanzania, that have really just made it illegal to, to really talk about the pandemic. So one of the reasons we're concerned about that is because, you know, honest press reporting is the, uh, is the, uh, at, at, it, that is, is crucial to the functioning of democracy. And if you don't have that honest press reporting, you can't have honest reporting about the pandemic. So I think the problems are really profound overseas. And you've also seen certain countries uh, like Zimbabwe and a number of other countries that are you know, throwing people in jail, throwing opposition people in jail. It's, 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 it's a quite concerned to us. So we don't quite have those problems here. But uh, you know, one issue that we uh, were, have been concerned about at Freedom House is, you know, the fog of, of disinformation that has come, we think, uh, from the government about the pandemic. Uh, that's been an issue that we've been concerned about. We've been concerned about, you might recall, uh, a few months ago when the military kind of cleared out a peaceful protest in Lafayette Park right across from the, the White House. Uh, and also during the primary season, there were some real problems in certain, uh, in certain uh, primaries in Wisconsin, for instance, or in Georgia, with actually the conduct of the primaries and long waiting lines and people you know, not being able to cast a vote in a timely way. Thankfully, it looks like the election uh, that just that took place last week seemed to be run in a reasonably efficient, effective way. I mean, uh, there's not been huge reports of people not being able to vote. Uh, so hopefully, you know, that's the problem that's taking care of itself. So there have been problems in the U.S., but I would say the problems overseas have been much more significant. Yeah. Well, in terms of COVID-19, I mean, what can we, what data can we rely on globally if there's a lot of misinformation? We don't know really what's coming out of China and a lot of these countries. Uh, what, what is real? What can we look at that gives us some really good data on that? Uh, that's a great question. I certainly think that, uh, uh, you know, you know the, the official health bodies, the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, there, you know, there's some private initiatives like at Johns Hopkins and, and other journalistic 
in, uh, enterprises that are giving accurate information. But I think there, there has been, you know, sadly, a lot of false information that's coming from governments around the world. And, uh, you know, our issue here is, is, is not so much the, uh, uh, the data, you know, the, the, we, we leave it to the public health experts to come up with that. But we do know that when we looked around the world, we saw that COVID is really affecting in some countries human rights and the provision of accurate inf and, uh, information. So that's what we want to that's what we wanted to point out in our report. Mm -hmm. Great. Just curious, how do you protect your sources around the globe? That is really one of the most challenging things, Kathy, at Freedom House. I mean, I really, as the president of Freedom House, the security of, of our staff and our partners and the analysts we work with is really almost the most important thing we do. And that's a point I've made to the staff. And there's both physical security and there's also you know, IT security. I mean, we are really uh, a target for candidly governments like the, the, the Chinese government, the Iranian government, the Russian government. So we take um, significant precautions. You know, we encrypt our communicate, you know, we, we talk in encrypted communications channels. We, we have very, we've really worked hard over the last couple of years to tighten our web security and, and our physical security to protect people around the world who work with us or partner with Freedom House. We're very fortunate, actually, that the chairman of Freedom House is Michael Chertoff. And Michael, as you might know, as your listeners know, is a former federal judge. He was also the Secretary of Homeland Security under the administration of George W. Bush. And Michael's firm now uh, is a firm that, among other things, really focuses on advising corporations and governments on security. So we've had actually the benefit of, of Michael's firm in making you know, recommendations to, 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 to my team about how to improve security. But that's really, in some ways, one of the biggest challenges we have going forward, because the bad guys, uh, as we saw from the, the China sanctions that I talked about, Kathy, are interested in, right. uh, uh, you know, going after us. Yeah. In your experience, when a country improves its democracy score, is there a general commonality as to the causes for an improvement? Does it come from people protesting, from violence, from government, from business, economic pressure, yeah, any commonality there? You know, it's a, it's, it's a lot of different, it's a, it's, a lot, it's a lot of different factors. I think that one thing I would, to flip your question a little bit in, the, in a different direction, I think one commonality between uh, both really both democracies that are struggling as well as authoritarian settings is that corruption is kind of an Achilles heel. That uh, what you've seen in many authoritarian settings is really, I would include Russia would be a great example, even China, uh, uh, some other countries as well, that corruption uh, is a big problem in authoritarian settings. And what you often have is uh, corruption is kind of an Achilles heel and it's uh, exposing the kind of seamy side of, 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 uh, uh, of a country that really offers opportunities in some ways for, uh, for, for people to push back. I mean, when, 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 when ordinary people see a country that's not delivering, that's where the leaders are enriching themselves. And a great example today might be Belarus, where uh, as, 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 as many of you the listeners may know, has been led, has been really ruled by a single person, Mr. Lukashenko, for the last 28 years. That's, uh, that's a country, by the way, that Freedom House has, 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 has been involved with over the last five to six years in terms of supporting civil society organizations there. But, uh, you know, Lukashenko really, Unlike some other authoritarians, he, he kind of dismissed COVID-19. He didn't deal with it. He, uh, and I think uh, he didn't take it seriously. And I think people saw that. And it kind of, when, when he had an election that he thought was going to be kind of a, which really was a rigged election in Belarus, the people didn't accept it. And, and, and we've had uh, every Sunday in Belarus since August, hundreds of thousands of ordinary people on the streets protesting what's happening. So I, I'm not sure there's one single thing going back to your question, but I do think that 
corruption and is, is kind of a common seed that offers opportunities for those who are interested in, in more freedom and in more democracy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How has political correctness in the U.S. squashed freedom of speech? How do you measure that? Well, at Freedom House, it's, it's a good question. At Freedom House, you know, we don't, it's kind of hard to measure political correctness. It's sort of in the eyes of the beholder. I mean, the one issue that we do look at is, is academic freedom. Uh, this is sort of a global issue. Uh, and academic freedom is something that has been under a great deal of pressure uh, in many different countries. Uh, you know, honestly, I haven't looked, I didn't look most recently at the freedom scores uh, with respect to academic freedom in the United States. I think we generally do pretty well, but you know, there have been some, some major challenges where people have not been able to, uh, you know, people with disfavored views have not been able to speak and that's, we, you know, that's, that's a problem. Uh, you know, we believe very much in, in, in free speech and the right to speak. So um, it, it's hard to kind of measure that question like in a clear metric kind of way, but it's something that, that, that we have to all uh, uh, be on the lookout for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be interesting to at least identify some trends on that. How do you think the internet and social media have helped or hurt freedom and democracy across the world? That is a fantastic question. And it's honestly, it's one of the issues that as a president of Freedom House, I think about almost more than anything. Yeah. You know, 10 years ago, we really felt that, that the internet, that the rise of social media was gonna be a net positive for the cause of freedom. Think if you remember about 10 years ago, the role that Facebook played in uh, helping galvanize protesters uh, in Cairo's Tahir Square and, uh, and really helped contribute to the downfall of the dictator in Egypt. And I think many people thought that that was gonna be a continuing trend, if you will. And, and to some extent, social media does play a positive role. If you think about Russia would be another example that to the extent that activists have been able to get out, for instance, YouTube videos showing the corruption of some of the Russian leadership, I think that that's a very positive thing. However, I think we have to also be honest that over the last you know, five or six years, it's become more clear that social media has been more of a kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, and for instance, we have seen an ability not just in the United States where this got a lot of attention, but our Freedom of the Net report, which is a really great report, I highly recommend it to, to your listeners, has really shown that, uh, that the bad guys have been able to kind of flood the zone with disinformation, uh, uh, launch Twitter mobs against human rights activists, and really kind of use social media to restrict freedom. I mean, I think about China, would be another example. I think that we all thought that China 20 years ago would not be able to control the internet and that it would, it would lead to more freedom in China, but that's not been the case. China has been able to great, create the so-called, which I talked about in my opening remarks, the Great China Firewall, and, and uh, it's got the most systematic system of censorship in the whole world. And not only is China now censoring its own people, but it's also, uh, uh, exporting the, you know, their, their tools of facial, of facial recognition, of surveillance to other countries to use in their own, uh, uh, against their own people. So I think one of the big questions going forward is that we, for, for, for is, is will technology be a force for good or for, or for evil? And I mean, I, I, we can fight back, but it's, but it's, but it's an open question right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A uh, couple of other questions. Do you believe our press and media in the U.S. is unbiased? <laughs> Are you trying to get me? A, I'm a former I, journalist. And uh, uh, look, let me say a couple things about the press. Number one, we are blessed, truly blessed, 
to live in a country where journalists are not thrown in jail as they are in Turkey, where journalists are not murdered as they have been in Russia, where journalists uh, really have a great deal of freedom to, to say what they want, to report what they want. And if you look at the whole panoply of, if you look at the whole panoply of media sources out there, then you really, uh, you really, you know, you can't say, you know, that if you're an ordinary citizen, you can't have access to information that would be of use to you. That might come from a more conservative point point of view, a more, you know, liberal point of view, or whatever point of view that you that you might be interested in. So I think, you know, and, and freedom house scores do show we, we do very well in terms of press freedom here in the United States. I would say the one concern that I have as a former journalist is that I do worry that we as citizens are not sometimes exposed enough to different points of view. I think that was revealed in the last election. I think, you know, there are large parts of, of, of American society that, you know, get their news from, from one source of information, others that get their news from different kinds of information. I think it's really important. I try hard in my own reading habits to expose myself to all sorts of different ideas and to understand that, you know, sometimes there are different ways of looking at that. But I will say, just in defense of the press, you know, they do an amazing job in terms of uh, really holding uh, uh, politicians and others accountable for misstatements, for corruption. And I'd rather be living in a society in which, uh, you know, that happens. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's some bias that's in the eyes of the beholder, but I do think that there are many, many countries around the world where people do not have the benefit of a press that really holds government accountable. And that's the big problem. Yeah. Thank you. That was a tough one. Freedom House has a lot of data that's accessible to all. How should we as businesses or uh, universities in Indiana best leverage that? Great question. Uh, first of all, I really feel that college students in particular, college faculty and the business community has a lot to benefit from Freedom House data. If you're a company that's thinking about making an investment decision in a country that may be a little bit off the beaten track, there is an enormous amount of data on the Freedom House website that's free, actually. <laughs> We're trying to think of actually a way to kind of monetize the information potentially, but it's free. And it will tell you about how a country does in the rule of law, how they handle issues of transparency and corruption, how they handle issues of uh, internet access, issues that are of great concern to the business community. So I would really recommend that anyone who has a business that has any kind of overseas uh, uh, responsibilities, that you take a look at the Freedom House scores, it should, the, the information. It's, and by the way, it's not just the, the scores themselves, but there's, it's the underlying data. And we really have a global perspective. And so we can really you know, show over time how these countries compare to each other in terms of the issues that might be of concern to you. And so we would, by the way, be very happy. And I think my colleagues can put our emails up on, up on the chat box. If you want to be in touch with us to get more information, we're happy to provide briefings and give you more information about that. But I really think this inf our information is of great use to businesses and, by the way, to, uh, to uh, college, uh, uh, on college campuses. I actually believe I'm 95% sure that, you're, that the president of Purdue, Mitch Daniels, was once on our board. And so I think he knows about Freedom House. And uh, if, I, if, I, if I got that wrong, it was not purposely fake news, but, I'm, but, but I think Mitch was on the board. Uh, I, know he, I know he believes in these issues. Uh, anyway, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Really interesting. Uh, we really appreciate your time and sharing this information with us and, and really kind of throwing out some tough issues for us all to think about. I um, love being here. It's really great. I really do. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. I love my annual trip to Indianapolis and to Bloomington to see my friends there. <laughs> and hopefully next we'll be able to do that. But it's really lovely to be with the Economic Club.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Today's presentation will be available online at economicclubofindiana.com. Please join us next month, uh, Tuesday, December 1st, to hear from journalist and author Alelia Bundles. And be sure to register for this virtual event and on our website and invite all your friends. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to get great information to folks. Information for each of the season's presenters can be found on economicclubofindiana.com and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.